think about these passages because without your support, without your uh, generosity, I wouldn't be able to do it. And so it's, they're fruits of labor and p- lots of prayer into our times together. And I do want you to know you are prayed for every single week. This time that we have is a precious time together, and we trust that the Lord would speak to us, speak to us, then also speak through us, both of those ways, because the times in the, in the foyer, the cafe, out in the parking lot, in this building, and throughout the week, God does speak to us, and sometimes he speaks through us as we connect to other people. And so, in our series, and this is part two, we are walking with Abraham in his journey of faith, a journey of faith, the life of Abraham. And if you were with us last week as we launched out, we saw his family background and what was happening. And we noted that uh, during a significant time of transition, this is when his dad had passed away, Abram needed to make a decision as to if he was going to remain there in Haran, if he was going to go back to Ur, or if he was going to continue on that journey that his dad originally took them down to Canaan. And this is when God met with him, and knowing that often when we are in uh, significant times of transition, we are seeking wisdom, we're looking to God, hopefully God does meet with us and tells us what we need to know when we need to know it. And God gave Abram a command, uh, a challenge, and then also the promise. As you remember, the command was, go to a place. And it was going and it was leaving. Leave your, your nation, leave your people, and for the most part, leave your family. He did, of course, bring his wife and his nephew and go to the land or the place that I will show you. And then connected with that command, that direction, were a series of significant promises made to this man, Abram. And he told him things like, I would bless you and I will make you into a great nation. That his name would be great so that, catch that, that he would be a blessing. God promised that he would bless those that blessed him and those that dishonored him, God would curse And that in Abram, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So he heard this command going to this unknown place by a word of a God that he had to decide if he could truly trust. Because he physically had to leave, he physically had to let go, to hold on to a promise. And Abraham started and continued the journey of faith. He moved down, and we saw how he moved and where he went, and he went, and he continued to persevere. So faith produces some things. It produces obedience. We saw that last week. It produces worship. We saw that in Abram's story. It produces prayer, and it produces perseverance. Now, the theme or the line I want you to remember over these 13 weeks, 12 weeks left, is this. Trust God's promises by living a life of faith. Ten years from now, okay, when you'll forget most of these details, my hope is that that line would be imprinted on your soul. That you will be reminded to trust God's promises. And we do this by living a life of faith. Now, in Abram's story, which of course turned, God turned his name to Abraham's, we'll see some great moments in which he passes the test, he moves forward, he remains faithful. And then we'll see in his faith journey that there is a time, times of wondering, there's times of fear, and there is some times of missteps. This should help you and I as well. As we continue trusting God's promises and we move forward in the power of his Holy Spirit, that we can know some things that are true about God and how they impact our life. So this morning, we're going to 
Now turn to this next passage after we read about these promises and Abram's faithfulness. How he takes a detour and steps into places which were ultimately not good for him. And in this passage for this morning, I trust that you and I will be instructed. I trust that there be a greater sense of hope in our hearts. I trust that you and I would be encouraged as we wait patiently for the promises of God to continue to be fulfilled in our lives. So the first thing that I want us to remember from this message this morning is this. Number one, know that hardships can keep you from trusting God's promises. True of Abram, and also, if you reflect upon your life, true of us. So here we go, Genesis chapter 12, verse 10. Now, there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. Let's pause right there and talk about this. Okay. Now, Abram had been following God obediently, faithfully, worshiping, connecting with him, persevering. And he was in the land that God directed him to go, specifically when he made the first uh, tabernacle there. He said, this is the place that I'm going to give you. And then while he was following God in obedience, while he was in the place he was to be, there was a famine, not just an average famine. It says a severe famine. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us this, just because you are faithfully following the Lord and exactly where you are to be does not mean you will not face difficulties, right? Remember that, okay? When someone tries to sell you a gospel that is not biblical, the Bible is clear that often, as we are following God, there are hardships that happen. You and I are not exempt from these things that are common to humankind. Abram and Sarai and Lot faced this. The whole region faced these things. So difficulties, trials, hardships come to all people. No one is exempt. And sometimes the hardships are severe. People lose their jobs. We get sick. Funding dries up. Accidents happen. People in our lives die. Friends move away. Sons move away. And sometimes we're just mistreated. Things happen in our lives. So what do you do then? Who or what will you turn to? Who and what will you trust? Now, it's interesting. When times are good, often it's 
easy for us to trust in the goodness of God. But we'll see in Scripture, and sometimes if you reflect upon your own life, sometimes when things are good, our dependence on God kind of evaporates, right? See that in the book of Judges, for sure. Perhaps in your own life. And then sometimes, depending on where you are theologically, when difficulties come, sometimes people press into God because we realize that those, time are, are, those times are frailness and our vulnerability and our need. And sometimes when difficulties come, people get angry at God. God, why... Did this happen? So there's a variety of responses that occur in our mind and in our heart to both prosperity and adversity. Again, the thrust is who do you turn to? What do you look to? And how and what and where do God's promises play into your heart and your mind? And your spirit and your trust. So here is our man, Abram and Sarai. They were following God. They were doing well. And then this severe famine came to them. Knowing God's promise and yet facing difficulties outside of their Control. So they decided not to stay in the land. They decided to go down to Egypt. They could have turned to the Sea of Galilee, which was there in the land of promise. They could have turned to the Jordan River Valley, which we'll read about in the next chapter, which was well watered, but they went to Egypt. Verse 11 of Genesis chapter 12. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, Now I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, They will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Now, say, you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of of you. Let's take a pause here. So here is Abram walking in faith, knowing God's promises, God telling him specifically, I'm going to bless you, and from your descendants, all the nations will be blessed. He had that somewhere in his mind. He believed that in his heart. And yet, when hardship came, he replaced God's sovereignty. And instead, this is interesting, put his wife in God's place. Now, when I was reading this, it struck me that his response to Sarai was, well, Sarai, because of you, I'm going to be killed. So if we do this other thing, if we kind of lie about what deceive then I'm going to live because of you. Okay, Abram, so Sarai now is sovereign if you live or die and not God? She's the one that controls if you're going to live or die? There are times in our life that we exchange our faith in the promises of God for our faith in someone else. Sometimes 
We connect our faith to our spouse, and we think they are our deliverer. They are our provider. They are sufficient. Or we can put it in our kids, or we can put it in our grandparents, or we can put it in the government. <laughs> Lord, help us, right? We have to check ourselves, in particular when things are hard. And I know for many of you right now, things are hard. The encouragement is, where are you? And be careful of and know that hardships can knock us off course. It's a test to see who will we trust in. Abram had a good wife, and he said, you know what? You are beautiful. And he was afraid of what was going to take place, so they devised a plan and they turned to their own wisdom. Again, he could have just stayed in that land. He could have just said, you know what, I'm going to remain here. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to take some provisions. But he says, no, I'm going to go down to denial, thank you very much, and go to that area. And he turned to his own wisdom. He turned to a promise or a savior that was different than the one who was faithful to his promise. So who are you trusting for your life? And who are you leaning on for life? So here are our faithful heroes of faith disguising themselves because they were afraid, going to the place where God never told them to go, by the way. And it's interesting, as we go along, you'll read in Genesis chapter 26, that the same thing happened <laughs> to Isaac. There was a severe famine, okay? And God specifically told him, hey, Isaac, by the way, don't go down to Egypt like your dad did. And by the way, he failed the test. He lied about his wife, Rebecca. The same deal, right? Same deal. But it's interesting to note, hey, don't go down there. So they were going to a place they never belonged with a plan that they were trusting in their own wisdom and their own power. Be careful of this. Verse 14, let's continue the story. So they entered Egypt when Abram came to Egypt. It's true that the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. Now when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they talked to Pharaoh about her. And she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, his now brother-in-law. And Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. So the plan was going somewhat as they thought, but it took a severe left turn. They didn't think through things all the way. And there are elements in our wisdom that we are completely blind to. And any time that you think you're smarter than God, I have news for you. You're not. Isn't that the original sin? My way, God, is better than your way. Isn't that when you and I have gotten in trouble in the past? Right? You know. And so they noticed that she was beautiful. Like, what were they thinking? Pharaoh, which had the power of a god in that culture at that time, could do anything he wanted. Recognized that she wasn't married, and perhaps if he would have realized that, he wouldn't have done anything. We don't know. But all of a sudden, she's taken. What was that conversation like? 
what was that like? Like, what did you think was going to happen? And now she was a part of his household. And they had, you know, we don't know how long this lasted, but it lasted for a little while, right? He got some stuff out of it, but he lost his wife, and there was a promise to her as well. Often in our own wisdom, we step away from the path of faith. One thing leads to another, leads to another, and down and more complicated it goes. And we know that story. It has been lived out thousands of years. So they're in a tough place. And again, I want to remind us of, and I want you to reflect upon, knowing that hardships can keep you from trusting God's promises. The reverse is what I want you to do, is to continue to follow him in faithfulness and trust him. That's the next point. Trust that God will be faithful to his word. So while they were there, the promises of God were still working. They were separated. They were in trouble. Don't know all that was taking place there, but it was not a good situation. How is these promises going to be fulfilled? What's going to happen here? Verse 17 continues the story. But the Lord. Don't you like that phrase? But the Lord. Active, involved, connected, remembering his promise to this couple. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases, plural. This wasn't just a tummy ache or a sliver. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases, not just on Pharaoh, but his entire household. Why? Because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. And we don't know how Pharaoh found out, but he found out. And he says, I'm going to have a conversation with this man. Abram, come here. And he asked this question. What have you done to me? He said, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say? She's my sister. So that I took her to be my wife. Now then, here's your wife. Take her and go. And for Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men. And they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. Now, if I was Pharaoh, I would have killed him right there. And he had the power to do so. No one would have questioned him. <laughs> Mike says, shame on you. Being honest about my flesh, right? If I wasn't following Jesus and I had that power, and because I was lied to by a, a refugee, let's be, you know, coming in, of uh, being kind to him, gave him all these gifts, let him live, right? Was very nice to him, and all of a sudden me and my whole household gets many serious diseases because someone lied to me. That would have been the end of the relationship. I would have said, give me all the stuff I just gave you. 
And you know what? I'm going to keep your sister. And then I'm going to take all the stuff you own, and I'm going to take your life. I see Pharaoh's letting them go as God's hand being faithful to his promise. God will be faithful even when we are faithless. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. 2 Timothy 2.13 Do you see God's hand in this? Because I do. And if you look at your own life and you think about God's pursuit of you, and some of you have followed God faithfully your whole life, and some of you have gone this way and gone a little bit this way, and went over here and maybe down here, and hey, look at that over there, and then come back, right? God will remain faithful to his promises, period. He will hold me fast. Even when we are faithless, he will remain faithful. Remember that. We know that God told them, Abram, you will be a blessing. I'm going to give you this land. Those who dishonor you, I will curse, which took place there. And Pharaoh didn't even know he was doing it. God cursed Pharaoh because of his love and promise to Abram. Abram. You guys catch this? God preserved his life even when Abram was misguided. And why? He is faithful to his word. And by the way, never hold God accountable for something that is not written in his word. That's a good amen spot. And why I say that so strongly is because People say they're disappointed with God or angry with God for something he never promised them. Hear me. Hear me. God promises never to leave you nor forsake you. Doesn't mean that you won't go through difficulty. God promises that he'll prepare a place for you. Doesn't mean that you won't die. God promises he will provide for you. Doesn't mean you always will be rich. why it's important to know his word because he is faithful to it every time. Can you trust his wisdom that he is working all things for his glory? Can you trust him in his wisdom that he is continuing to conform you in the image of his son? Your roots grow deep, just like plants. When it's dry on the surface, there's always more down deeper, so go deeper. Trust that God will be faithful to his word. Abram and Sarai knew and found this out. And this very vulnerable place in which their life was on the line, but God. And they were let go. And all the things that they acquired, they were able to keep and they could go as a couple. So, what happened next? This is the next point. If you have stepped away off the path of God and you're doing things or you're in a place where you know you don't belong, return to the place of blessing. 
Now, I continued into chapter 13 because we have to understand this journey. He went down. God met him. He was unfaithful. God was faithful. And then what happened? Verse 1 of chapter 13. Till Abram, he went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had. And Lot, which was his nephew, went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, or Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai. Remember this where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There, Abram called on the name of the Lord. Aren't you grateful that God offers a way back? That's why we love the story of the prodigal son. That's why it's so dear to us. That's why we love the good shepherd leaving the 99 to go find the one that was strayed. That's why we love the parable of the lost coin and the lost sheep. God makes a way for us to return back. One of the promises we heard last week that we hold on to is a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Matthew 12, 20. God doesn't say, enough of you. He doesn't say, yeah, I know you're struggling, but let me help. doesn't do that. His promises remain faithful, even though we, at times, are unfaithful. The door remains back. Yes, did Abraham and Sarai suffer? Did they need counseling after this? Probably. Welcome PTSD. Was it difficult? It was. Was there a price to pay? There was, but God continued to make a way for them to return. And Abram, after this journey, because of hardship, realized there were some missteps and misplaced faith, was seeing God's goodness and was allowed to go back, and he returned back to the place of prayer and worship and the land of blessing. This happens in lives, and this might be happening in your life even as you sit here this morning. One of my favorite places to turn when thinking about lives of churches and my own life and lives of individuals where Christ addresses the churches in the book of Revelation, one of the churches he addresses is the Ephesians, and we love often the book of Ephesians, so rich, so deep, so good, so wonderful. But unfortunately, over the passing of time, the love they had for Christ at first had grown, grown cold, even though they were doing the things, kind of, it became, religion became just that, religion, an obligation, something that they always do, sitting in the same spot, talking to the same people, doing the same things. He says, hey, and for you, perhaps, who have lost your first love, take Jesus' counsel to remember how it once was when your love for God and Christ was burning brightly. Remember that. Remember the heights from which you have fallen. Repent. And then thirdly, return and do the things you did at first. Even if you don't feel like it, or especially when you don't feel like it. 
When was the light of Christ the strongest in your heart? What were you doing then? I was ravishingly consuming God's word. I was talking to Christ all the time, and I was talking to others all the time about him. So here we are this morning. Here God is this morning. I'm grateful for the story of Abram, and we can say amen. I'm grateful that God didn't hide from us the less than faithful parts because it helps us and encourages us and gives us, here's the word, hope, right? And so we're going to have a time of prayer this morning. And I'm going to invite you forward for those who want prayer. If our musicians could come up, that would be great. So here's the call, and this is how it's going to work. There's three groups of people in this room. First group of those of you who have been through stuff, and you're holding on, and you're doing well. Be encouraged today. Continue to believe God's promises. He will not fail you. There's a second group of people who are here this morning, and you are facing hardship, just like Abram And the hardship is severe. (laughs) The invitation is to pray. And the third group of people are are those who know that they're living in the land of Egypt, so to speak. Haven't necessarily given up the faith, but you've become dependent upon your own power or your own wisdom or other people, and you've put them in the place of God. An opportunity to return, to remember, to repent. And walk back to him. So I'm going to pray for us. And then, at the end of that prayer, or even during that prayer, here's the invitation. You can come sit here in this front pew, or that one. You can come around here. And if you, you don't have to tell me anything. We'll have other people here to pray for you, right? You just come up, you can kneel or stand or sit or whatever. Myself and others will just pray for you. You don't have to say a word. We'll just pray for you, pray for you, pray for you, pray for me. You say, I I need prayer because I'm going through hardship right now and it is difficult. I want to pray. Or if you say, hey, today is... a day in which I want to return, then let that be the case. And you may want to come up just to praise God for his faithfulness. Do that too. And so I'm going to pray, and you can come forward, and we'll pray, and they'll do a a song. And then if you want to go, go ahead and do it quietly. Go to the cafe. Please do that. Spend time out there talking. If you want to remain in here, you can do 